Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. The Great One. And that's what he is. The Great One. Paul Keels, the voice of Ohio State football. Welcome, Great One. So, um, quite a football team you got there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> C.J. Stroud uh, is a guy that is a you know is a redshirt sophomore. You've seen him now develop. What have you seen in his development that has allowed this offense to run with the efficiency it has run with? Well, Steve, the the real difference with C.J. this year uh, it, it is the fact that you're noticing him being a little more mobile, not mobile as far as running uh, and advancing the ball upfield, but running to keep plays alive, moving laterally, left to right, right to left, to keep a play open and allow a receiver get open. And, and, you know, the other parts you would expect as a young man gets older too, a little more comfortable with things, a little more assertive as a leader, but, you know, also maybe the best thing you can say about C.J. Stroud, I think it was a few weeks ago, and they beat Rutgers, and he threw only two touchdown passes, and people thought, Oh, God, it wasn't a good game for C.J. Stratt. He's all about winning, whether he throws two, whether he throws none. Um, and, you know, I think also, Steve, we've seen in the last couple of games, he threw a pick six against Michigan State. Very next drive comes back and leads leads a touchdown drive. Last week he gets knocked over by um, uh, Joe Evans of Iowa, fumbles the ball. Evans picks it up, runs it in for a defensive score, brings him right back to take him down the field. So all of the kind of things you would expect a young quarterback to continue to grow with. Jackson Smith and Jigba had, what, 347 in the Rose Bowl? Some insane number like that. And was terrific against Penn State. We know he's been banged up. What have you seen from the others in the group? Abuka, Harrison, who really was great in the Rose Bowl, Julian Fleming. What have you seen from that? And also Kate Stover. That They really haven't missed Jackson as much as they'd love to have him out there. But... You know, and really the guy that made the big splash the very first week was a fifth-year former walk-on, Xavier Johnson, yeah. who caught the go-ahead touchdown against Notre Dame. You know, what they've done, Steve, as you would expect, they presented a number of different threats that a defense all has to be aware of. You mentioned Emeka Ibuka, Marvin Harrison, the guy that's come on as of late, Julian Fleming. Yeah. He missed the first two games, but ever since then, he's caught a TD in every game. Uh, Cade Stover at tight end. Mitch Rossi, who's used as like a fullback slash yeah. tight end. G. Scott, who's also a tight end threat. So it's it's been a combination of all of those guys. As much as they would love to have Jackson Smith and Jigba there, and who wouldn't, uh, they've not missed a beat offensively without him. So Travion Henderson, we know what kind of dynamic running back he can be, and he's been banked up as well. Tell us a little bit the story of Mayan Williams, who's an Ohio kid and Ryan Day's connection that got him there and to see a guy step in the way he has? Well, you know, he comes from one of the uh, outside of the city limits of high schools in Cincinnati, Wynn Woods, who in the last five years has really been one of the contending programs. And, you know, I think because they've won and they've had success, that's what got he and others on Ryan Day's radar. They've got a, you, you may remember uh, Jerron Cage, the defensive mm-hmm. lineman who scored the defensive touchdown last year against Penn mm-hmm. State. He's from Winton Woods also. And and I think that's what got Ryan Day on them. And Mayan Williams is a guy that he and Travion Henderson bring a little bit of a different style, but some similarities also. Mayan is a little more of a bulky, physical type of back but can really break away and show some explosive speed. Henderson is the guy that's kind of your prototypical tailback. And, you know, now finally for the first time in a while, they're both healthy at the same time. So, you know, they give Ohio State some great production there. The other young man that has looked good is Dallin Hayden, a first-year player. They didn't really expect him because Evan Pryor was going to be the number three but suffered a season-ending injury in the summer. But, you know, one of the things that, that Ryan Day was insistent on this year, going into the year, that they have balance and that they had the kind of running threat that could extend drives and get them what they needed in the red zone. Defensively, Tommy Eichenberg made a play last week that Jack Ham looked at me and he said, now that's how a linebacker needs to make a play like that. <laughs> so you can let Tommy know that that Jack, you may have to explain to him who Jack is. Right. Because uh, right. I'm not joking about that because younger players are like, oh, oh, okay. You know, sometimes you do have to explain it to him. He's a captain. Uh, and when you look at how he's played, what does he do, not only physically, but the mental side of it, to get them in the right spots defensively? He gets himself in the right spot, Steve. That's kind of been the whole transformation of his game. You know, last year everybody was kind of 
you know, complaining a little bit about the linebacking group. And if you think back to two years previously, Ohio State lost the top four linebackers they had. And Tommy Eigenberg and, and Steel Chambers, who had moved from running back mm-hmm. to linebacker, it really took them a year to kind of get their footing. And Cody Simon dealt with an injury late last year. Now, Eichenberg and Chambers have really said Tommy has the kind of size you would expect yeah. uh, a linebacker to have, but he also has really shown now his ability to cover ground laterally. And I think now with the way he and Steel Chambers play off one another, Cody Simon, who they used a little bit of a three linebacker set last week against Iowa, uh, he's been able to play the way you kind of thought he would last year. Um, but, you know, I think Tommy would probably be the first one to tell you they benefit from the disruption of the offensive line and the way that the secondary is covered. What kind of difference have you seen in a Jim Knowles defense? It is heavily dependent on safety play. Yeah. So when you combine Ronnie Hickman, Tanner McAllister, who game with Knowles from Oklahoma State, yeah. Lathan Ransom, Cameron Martinez, Josh Proctor went healthy, and a couple of young guys, Kai Stokes and Sonny Styles, who've gotten some licks out there. It's a group that really allows them to cover the pass, but also make the kind of plays in assisting on the run that maybe safeties don't traditionally do. And and it's also allowed them to not have to change so much when the offense changes. And so, you know, the the other thing, Steve, that what Jim Knowles has done, which I don't know that I've ever heard a coach say this, they've told these defensive players, or he has anyway, if they make a mistake, it's the coach's fault because they didn't put them in the right position. And that seemingly has taken the pressure off these players to just go out and play. Ronnie Hickman has always been that guy to, to me that's been back. There's like a quarterback back there in the in the secondary. What have you seen in his development over the years where it looks like he's a next level guy? You know, I think you know. Last year they used him more as a linebacker. Now it's kind of a hybrid type of backer and safety position. And and, and much like we talked about Tommy Eichenberg, but in a different area, lines people up, gets them ready. You know, gives out a lot of the signals there, and and is able to kind of retrace his steps and make up ground like you wouldn't expect a big safety like that to do. And and a guy that just kind of has a a real good leadership knack from what the coaches tell us. And you know, I think that's something that has, has helped him play confident and has given this defense a great deal of confidence. And you mentioned. McAllister, who's got the three picks, including two last week against Iowa. Uh, he, he obviously knew what he was getting into when he followed Jim here. What, what has he added to that defense? Well, Jim, Jim Knowles has talked about Tanner McAllister like a coach on the field. And, you know, he came here and, you know, was not promised anything, just an opportunity to compete. And he's shown the experience. I think that's been it, Steve. Just, you know, he's been able to fit right in, you know, especially given they didn't know what they were going to get from Lathan Ransom coming off a broken leg yeah. in the Rose Bowl last year. You know, in some other areas, Josh Proctor coming off the injury he had last year. He's a guy that the, the only thing really you can say is you can tell that's an experienced player out there. Yeah, no question. You can see it. Michael Hall Jr. really started off the season really well, and I know he's right up there in tackles for losses and sacks on this team. What do you see from him that may be a little bit different than somebody else? Just for somebody his size to be able to flash into the backfield as quickly as he does. Now, you know, a couple of weeks ago they limited some of his reps. He'd been banged up a little bit. But a guy that just all of a sudden he gets off the ball in such a hurry, and the next thing you know, he's he's past the offensive line. Uh, but as you've seen Ohio State's defensive lines over the years, Steve, and there's not a Nick or a Joey Bosa or a Chase Young on this defensive line, but a group that can, as a group, be disruptive and allow for individuals to make plays like what Mike Hall did earlier in the year, like Zach Harrison has done in the last couple of weeks. So it's been that gang mentality that has allowed all of those guys and others at times to be able to flash. But Mike Mike Hall just it looks like, you know, to the naked eye, he can get off the ball in a hurry and really wedge himself between linemen. You know, what's interesting is that I think a lot of people don't realize Ohio State has not played Michigan in your stadium in four years. <laughs> exactly. Right? Right? People don't realize that. It's also the first time that, you know, they've come in here with a crowd here in four years. Just your thoughts, just even from a personal point of view of, of, of coming in here, because you haven't seen a crowd here in four years. Well, and you know what it was like for those of us that couldn't travel and did away games yeah. remotely during the pandemic. Yeah. And and the game at Penn State in 2020 was the first one we had to do like that way. And, it, you know, nobody cares about how difficult it was on us. And it was. <laughs> However, the thing that, that Brian Daz talked about this week, there are a few players – that are on this team that were there in 18, so they know what it's like. You know, the other questions came, well, you know, a difference between daytime and nighttime. You know, they could start this thing at 9 a.m., and we know it would be a raucous <laughs> environment. So, but, you, you, you know, the crazy thing, Steve, this is just Ohio State's second road game. Yeah, they open the year with five straight at home, which 
some of us loved. But, you know, I think there's enough experienced players on this team that have played, you know, last year and previously in road environments. And certainly the one at Penn State is, is unlike any other. Um, but, you know, they know, and I think that's where the leadership of people like Eichenberg and Stroud and so mm-hmm. many others, you know, Tanner McAllister, who you mentioned, that's going to be important for this team going in there. I have to ask you about Ryan Day, because everyone knows what Jim Trestle did. Everyone knows what Urban Meyer did. Ryan Day's come in, and the beat has continued there. Why? I think because uh, outstanding recruiter, number one, outstanding quarterbacks coach, which was what he was brought in to do when he was hired as an assistant. I think he's made some good hires on his staff. He's made some tough decisions after last year to uh, let go some guys that had been part of this program for a while, but changes obviously needed to be made, especially on the defensive side. And, you know, I think he's he's just consistent. And not that it counts for anything in a win or a loss column. He's such a darn good guy. He makes our job a lot easier. Yep. He's great with fans when he has to be around him. Um, and, you know, I think when the, the, in 2018, when he had the three games where he was the acting head coach, I think that's where Ohio State and a lot of people realize this is a guy that's got a future as a head coach, and it's very fortunate for Ohio State that it worked out that he was able to be the next head coach here. Yeah, and again, people don't care about our jobs and what we do. And I understand that. But I remember when he got the job, because, I mean, you know how, to be honest with you, it's great. It's been great for me with Joe, with Bill, with James. I mean, I really had it, like, pretty easy. Uh it, it sounded right away, with all due respect to anybody else, okay, that right away he understood, you know, like, that he opened the door for you guys. He really did. And we saw that in 18 when he had the three games as acting head coach. Yes. And, you know, and, you know it's, it's not a secret to people for as successful as he was. Urban Meyer was a challenge to deal with from a media standpoint and wasn't always the best fan-friendly individual. You can't argue with what he did as a coach. But Ryan Day has encapsulated it all. And he's a guy that I think a lot of that filters down to the players and the families of the people he's recruiting. Uh, but his track record, you know, look at what he did as a quarterback's coach with J.T. Barrett, with Justin Fields, and now what he's doing with C.J. Stroud. I think that, that that's probably what speaks to itself. But he also is one of those head coaches that allows his other coaches to do their jobs. He basically has made Jim Knowles the head coach of the defense. Mm-hmm. He gives a lot of latitude to Larry Johnson, as anybody should, on the defensive line. And and has, you know, really seen other coaches like Brian Hartline develop with what he's done with the wide receivers, Tony Alford with a running back. So he's a head coach that, that really allows his assistant coaches to flourish under him. My friend, I can't wait to see you on Saturday. Likewise, looking forward to it. Thanks, Paul. You got it, Steve. 